Well, hello. How are we feeling today? Oh, come on. It's Saturday. How are we feeling today? That's a little better. Welcome to Vineyard Church, everyone. My name is Parker Mathias. I'm the next generation pastor here. So that means kids, youth, and college. And I have the privilege of talking to you today. We've been in the series um, about talking to our kids about stuff that matters, right? And if we're honest, these aren't just conversations that parents need to have with their kids. For those of us who don't have kids, they're conversations we need to have with ourselves, with our friends, and to be honest, with God. And so what I'm going to be talking, keep that in mind, because what I'm talking to you today about is helping our kids hold on to faith. And when I said that, some of you were like, shoot, I need help holding on to my faith. <laughs> and to that, we said a big, in Jesus' name, amen, come on. Holding on to faith is hard. It's difficult. I mean, it's hard enough to hold on to our faith in remedial things on a daily basis, and now you add in a God to that? I got to hold on to my faith with God. Where do I even start? So some of you are thinking, hey, where do I even start uh, grasping at a faith to hold on to? And we know that the world is, is, is constantly changing and things are growing. And so I, I, I tend to ask myself, hey, what kind of faith do I need to live in this world today? What kind of faith do the kids and your kids in, in the kids' ministry right now need to operate in the world today? Do the students need in youth ministry to operate in today's world? Or better yet, sometimes I ask myself this, what kind of faith do I need in order to help raise young leaders of the faith today? Amen? See, I'm talking about a kind of faith where it's not just a, a social media post, right? A nice little Facebook um, a post hit send and then we walk away and forget about it. I'm not talking about a, a Bible verse in your Instagram bio. I'm talking about a face-to-face -face people living out their faith on a daily basis, right? In, in the middle of their school classrooms or at the lunch table, in the middle of your workplace or, or to a random person sitting in Starbucks. That's the kind of faith that we would love for our kids to have, right? Like the kind of faith that withstands pressures from peers or, or when people come at their, their commitment to purity, right? And instead of bending into what the world will tell you is acceptable, like alcohol or drugs or sex or, or independence or even isolation, and if we're honest, sometimes pride, but bending into our faith as what holds us through the pressures of life. And I know when we hear the phrase peer pressure, right, we often think of it as an adolescent phrase, but when we say that, we really just mean, hey, your life, your faith is influenced by something, it's shaped by something or someone. There's this uh, guy in the Old Testament, his name is Isaiah, and he was a prophet, okay? And it was a prophet's job to hear from God and then go out and speak what God spoke to them to God's people, no matter how confrontational um, or controversial those statements were. Were. And so we get um, this thing. He said many things, but this is one thing that he said um, in Isaiah. He says this, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Now, he was speaking specifically to a nation that was rebelling against God, but, but I think these words apply to us today, and we hear it in so many different ways, right? Without vision, the people will perish. That's also scripture. John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. We have to stand for something or we will fall for anything. Jesus said it in a different way. He said, hey, the person who, who builds his house on the rock, when the, when the storm comes, their house will not fall. And how many of you know houses are complicated, right? <laughs> I'm a homeowner and I'm currently dealing with a rain leak. All homeowners just sighed inside of their heart. They said, oh, ho, ho. yeah, it turns out when they redid the balcony before I bought it, they didn't lay the foundation correctly. And so it's leaking in between the balcony into my laundry room right now. And don't worry, I got a solution. I got some help with that. And it's cost effective in Jesus' name. <laughs> um, but houses are complicated, and yet they're so important. And on top of that, I don't know about you, but it feels like every couple months I've got somebody in my life who's moving, you know, new house, new apartment. Um, they sold their house or, or just a new roommate somewhere else. And you know what that means. Hey, can you help me move? And uh, I don't mind helping people move. I helped a lot of people move. But you know there's always those couple pieces of furniture that are really awkward to carry. right? Maybe it's a desk that was poorly designed or, my least favorite, a mattress covered in plastic wrap. You know, <laughs> just like... There's, there's no good way to carry that. You know, you, you, you like squeeze with all of your might. You're like... Huh! 
and then you squat and you lift it up and then you do the awkward like shuffle thing you're like like shuffling to wherever you need to go but what eventually happens it slips and it either falls or you have to drop it and readjust your grip because it's just it's not easy to carry it's it's like there's just not a defined it's not a clear way to carry this mattress it's hard to take hold of undefined beliefs are almost impossible to take hold of they're hard if you don't know what it really means to have faith in Jesus, how are you supposed to live it out? It makes it that much harder when your friends at school dismiss your beliefs to stay faithful. When someone questions your commitment to purity to stay faithful, right? When your friends are all going to that one place where you know they're going to do that one thing, <laughs> it's hard to say no when your beliefs aren't clearly defined. It's hard to stay committed. So what do we need, right? That's the magic question. What do we need? What do our kids need uh, to have faith? Well, this is, this is what they need. We need a faith worth holding on to. We need something worth holding on to. Unfortunately for our kids, unfortunately for you, unfortunately for everyone else who's not in that season of life, we already have access to that faith. It's waiting to be taken hold of. Now, in this church, we have over 50 amazing team members on the Next Generation team. Can we give it up for them real quick? Yeah, team members who love on your babies in the nursery, team members who pray, um, equip, challenge your kids in preschool, elementary, middle school, and high school, spe specifically God bless the middle school leaders. I mean, come on, it's, just a, it's a weird time to, to, to be going through life. And they're, man, they're just so amazing at what they do. And to be honest, there's room for that. So if you're interested, let me know. But... That's not enough for your kid to develop this. An hour and a half a week, two hours on a Wednesday night if you're in youth. That's not enough. Not for the world that we live in today. And here's the honest truth. The most important person to your child's faith is you. The, most person, the person who can have the most impact on your child's faith with the most, most influence, the person that's with them constantly is you. It's our mission um, in both youth ministry and kids ministry not to be the primary discipler of your students, but to ideally equip you to do that even better. We need a faith worth holding on to. So today I'm going to share three things with you. And I believe that if you put these into practice, that they will actually help you develop that faith, that faith within you worth holding on to, and then help you develop that faith in other people, whether you are a parent or a friend with influence or, 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 or a, work, a worker with influence or just someone in your sphere of life that you have influence over. That's, that's my prayer for you today. So what are we going to do? We're going to hold on to faith. We're going to hold on to faith. And, and, and this first point that's coming up, it's arguably the most important. Because if this one is off, everything else is, is, is going to be off. When you check that box, Christian, do you know what it really means? Do you know what it really means to say, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer. I, I believe that God is real. I asked this question a couple weeks ago, and, and I want to pose it again to you today. What was Jesus' actual invitation for our lives? What did he really want from us? Because I think today in America, we make it a lot about believing in the right things, but but we, we kind of discussed a couple weeks ago, you can watch it online, that belief was, was the starting point, but it wasn't the ultimate invitation of Jesus. Right? What was the reason? Well, this was the reason. Come and follow me. Come and live life with me. Don't, don't walk alone, but actually walk by my side. Live with me. Don't just believe, because if you just believe, it, it, it leaves room for, for interpretation. But if you follow me, then when you get tempted to treat me like just some boxes to check off on your routine, we can work on that. Guys, faith in Jesus is not a good boy, good girl club. It's not church membership. It's not a political conviction. It's not a self-help uh, 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 philosophy. It's not legalism. It's not something you have to clean yourself up for before you engage in it. See, following Jesus is simply that. It's living our lives to him, and when we add in all of that extra stuff, it actually undermines the power of the gospel and the holiness of God. And so my first point for you today, what do we need to do in order to hold on to our faith? We need to get clear on what it means to follow Jesus. We need to get clear. 
It can't be ambiguous. It, it, it can't be just a, a fluffy one statement. The, the Bible says that God's word needs to be written on our hearts. We need to know what it means to follow Jesus, that it's actually a daily decision. It's a daily choice to live each and every day as if Jesus lived a life, died for us, and was resurrected, defeating sin in our lives. Amen? Like, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. So I figured I'd make it easy for you. Okay, I've got a definition. Um, This is the definition. A Christian is someone who has decided to follow Jesus for all of their life, in all areas of their life, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. Come on, the seasoned Christians say amen. This doesn't mean we're not going to fall. It doesn't mean that, that, that everything in our life is going to become perfect. It doesn't mean sin isn't going to happen. And it also doesn't mean that it's all, it all rests on our shoulders. What does it say? By the power of the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we, as believers, we, we hype ourselves up as if we're keeping God, but in reality, God's keeping us. He's sustaining us. Where he's calling us, where he's leading us, he's sustaining us with the power of his presence. But this right here, it doesn't come lightly. Remember, believing in God is free. It's a free gift. But following God requires something from us. Why? What? Well, one of my favorite guys in the New Testament, Paul, he uh, was a not great guy. (laughs) He was actively hunting down and arresting Christians so that they could be tried and executed for their crimes against, you know, whatever he could fabricate. And he did this well. He did this successfully until Jesus encountered him. And when he encountered Jesus, his life radically changed, and he began to plant churches all across the Middle East and parts of Asia and parts of Europe. And so we actually get to read the letters that he wrote to some of these churches, and one in particular that he wrote to a church in Greece. He said this, he said, we're Christ's representatives. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We represent Jesus. That's why it's important to be clear on what we mean by I'm a Christian. Because we represent, say it this way, we are um, God's physical embodiment on earth today. When people look at you, they see God. We are that. And this is both beautiful and terrifying. (laughs) Right? It's scary. Because we don't always get it right. Matter of fact, there are some of you here in church today that have been hurt by people who called themselves Christians. And this happens because there's this tension when we accept Jesus, when we say, yes, I believe in you. Um, our, our, our hearts have shifted, but our behaviors have not changed. And we want to hold on to our belief while maintaining the acts of the world, by, by, by maintaining the life that everyone else is living. But this confuses people, confuses your kids. And then people get hurt. Why would anyone want to be a part of a religion that acts just like the rest of the world? And so I just want to say, hey, if that was you, if you experienced hurt from someone who called themselves a Christian, someone you trusted to pour into you, someone you trusted to speak life into you, and they took advantage of that, I just want to, on behalf of the church, apologize. Whether that was here or a thousand miles away, it doesn't matter, we're all one in, in Jesus. And so I just want to say sorry because that's not accurate to the gospel. And that, most importantly, was not God. Don't give up on it. Give him another chance. That's why it's important for us to understand what it actually means to follow Jesus. That's why it's important for your kids to understand what it actually means to follow Jesus, the real God, not just this fabricated thing that we make up for. See, God has called us to be set apart. He's called us to be a holy people. He's called us to be marked by love, to be humble, but at the same time, be strong. And on top of that, live sacrificially. And you know these things. But one of my favorite quotes, um, it's from St. Francis, it's, it's this. It says, let us always preach the gospel and sometimes use words. Let us always preach the gospel and sometimes use words. What does it mean? Hey, let's let our actions represent what we believe on the inside. Let's let us not just all be talk, but let's walk the walk. 
Why is it that we work harder to achieve our dream job or our dream house or our dream body than it is the eternal security of the ones that we love? You see, our kids are actually watching and modeling all of those closest to them. They learn far more than we realize. I'll give you an example. My great-grandmother, um, she lived to she about uh, 95 years old. She passed away um, this past December, but she lived a long, amazing, beautiful life. But she had this thing that she would do, and, and I will never forget it. It just brings me joy. Anytime someone would make a joke, or anytime someone would just say something funny or something humorous would come up, she would chuckle. And then she had this phrase that she would say every time, multiple times in a conversation. She'd go, ah, oh, me. And I was like, dang, that's cute. <laughs> That's cute. And then when I was uh, in middle school, um, early teenage years, I noticed that my grandma actually did the same thing. I was just spending the night at her house, and, and we were joking around, and she goes, ah, oh, me. And I was like, that's so funny. So funny. And then a couple years ago, um, I'm driving in the car with my mom. And we're joking around, and we're laughing. And for the first time, I heard her go, ah, oh, me. <laughs> And I was like, you did it. You're just like your mom. <laughs> she probably didn't want to hear that. But, <laughs> but I say that, I know, I know that's funny, but, but it's true. We model those who are closest to us. And this isn't just an observation. This is a scientific fact. Studies show that kids um, from 0 to 13 uh, are modeling, learning, adapting to the behaviors of their parents. They're watching you, and they're learning from you. See, I'm spending a lot of time on this because it's important. You will never be perfect. Don't hear that, parents. You'll never be perfect. <laughs> You'll never get to the place that, that, you, that you're supposed to be, that your mind tells you that you're supposed to be. But it's important that you get this. It's important that you rest in this. If you are one of the most important people in your child's life, then it is so important that you begin to set an example of what it really means to follow Jesus, of what it really means to be a believer. And I can promise you, that's the gift that keeps on giving. So how do we develop a faith that's truly following Jesus, right? How do we develop a faith that, that, that um, you know, starts at believing but, but enters into following and, and, and requires something from me? Well, let me tell you something. Some of the believers that I admire most do not have doctor degrees in theology. They just, every day, spend a couple minutes in God's Word. And by the time they get to their age, I'm not going to say old, I'm going to say seasoned, they are just so rooted in God's Word. So how do we get to that place? How do we know what it means to follow Jesus? You've got to read your Bible, because it's right there. It's laid out for you. It is the lifeblood of what it means to be a believer. It is what sustains us. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And so we've got to read it. We've got to participate in it. Okay, so, so we're going to um, achieve a faith that's worth holding on to, and we're going to acknowledge that it's already ready for us. we just got to grab it. And so I'm going to get clear on what it means to follow Jesus. I'm not just going to pretend like I know what's going on, but I want to set the proper example for my friends, for my kids, for those I most influence, right? But Parker, you said something's required of me. I didn't forget it. So what is it? What is required from us? Well, there's many things we have to lay down to follow Jesus, but I think they can kind of be summed up in one. Jesus wants your identity. He wants your identity. So what are we going to do? We're going to get clear of what it means to follow Jesus, and we're going to get rooted in my new identity in Jesus. Rooted, planted, secure, firm, unwavering. That's what we're going to do. And on the surface, this seems like a lot. <laughs> It seems like too much to ask for, but in reality, it's everything you've ever wanted. It's everything you ever wanted. When I was 12 years old, I started running track. I joined the track team at my middle school, and I fell in love. Fell in love. Now, I wasn't the fastest, but it brought me joy. It brought me so much joy. It was a stress reliever for me. Um, it made me excited to be a part of something other than, than school and my normal day-to-day. -day. When I turned 17, I ran my first half marathon, and I would go on to run several more after that. And 
Um, then I developed a, a passion for mud runs and, and all of those fun things and color me rad and just, just hey, whatever I could get a medal, I was going to do it. <laughs> and I just fell in love with running. And when people would ask me, hey, what do you do for fun? Running was always on my list. Always. But see, my family has a history of knee problems. And late last year, I noticed that any time I would run two miles or more, my knees would just be throbbing for days. <laughs> and so I stopped. So let me give it a month. Let me give it, a, let me give it two months. And I go out again, still pain, still pain. And so finally, I got to a place where I said, you know what? I think I've got to give this up. It's not good for me. And guys, that hurt. <laughs> I've been running longer than I've been walking with Jesus. <laughs> it became a part of me. It, it left a hole in me, if, if I'm honest. It leads me to think, okay, when somebody asks me, what do I do for fun? What am I going to say? <laughs> I read my Bible. <laughs> you know, I'm at church all the time. You're like, so what do I say? What do I tell people? I don't know. What, like, who am I? But that's not how God wants us to live. And this is a minor example, but what happens when our lives are centered around our kids and then they grow up and graduate and move out? What's left of us? What is our marriage then? What happens when that dream job we've been working so hard for, we attain it, we love it, we live by it, it's who we are, and we lose it? Who are we then? What happens when that friend that you just invested everything in, that relationship that you invested everything in, swept up from under your feet? Who are you then? John, a close friend of Jesus who literally witnessed the crucifixion and saw Jesus after he was resurrected, he quotes Jesus saying this in his gospel. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. See, when you receive Jesus, when you acknowledge him, his sacrifice, that your sins were nailed to the cross with him. He's bringing you into a relationship with God the Father. And when you say yes to that, when you follow him, your identity gets an upgrade. It gets a promotion. You go from servant or, or, or small being in this vast universe to friend of the Son of God, to child of God, to co-heir with Christ in the kingdom of God. When you lose a friend that's close to you, you're still a child of God. When that relationship that you covet ends, you're still a child of God. When that job is dismissed from you or taken from you or you just mess up and lose it, you're still a child of God. Why is identity so important? Because believe it or not, God, not, God never promises a happy-go-lucky, rainbows and butterflies kind of life. Matter of fact, he tells us the opposite. And yet, for some reason, we only tell our kids the fluffy parts of God. <laughs> and then when they grow up and they experience life, their faith is tested. And the faith that they were given doesn't match up to the realities of life. A rooted identity is essential. It's essential to holding on to faith. John, again, he quotes Jesus uh, saying this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, not happiness, not prosperity, not overflowing riches, though, though God does bring that to people, not a happily ever after, but peace. Why? Because in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I, Jesus, has overcome the world. See, we live in a world that tells us we are defined by the number of people who follow us on social media, or the number of zeros in our bank accounts, or the cars that we drive, or the people that we're connected to. But get this, your gender, your sexuality, so many different things. The world says, well, that's who you are, and it's the most important aspect of who you are. But the truth is, all of those things are temporary. All of those things fade. All of those things don't compare to the eternity of God. And when my identity is rooted in something that is temporary, my identity is temporary. So what happens when it's taken away? Identity crisis. And I don't mean the 50-year-old kind. <laughs> when we're rooted, right, 
when we're secure in something that is eternal, guess what we get to do, guys? Live unoffended. (laughs) We get to live unoffended. When troubles come our way, when people mess up, when they say something that we don't like, when they tell someone we told them not to tell them, we get to live unoffended because my identity isn't in that person, it's in Jesus. When I don't get the car that I wanted, when I still drive my 2003 Honda Accord that's got over 200,000 miles on it, it doesn't matter. And I roll through a nice, wealthy neighborhood, I feel great because I don't have a car payment. Come on. (laughs) Okay, let me give you some practical steps. How do we get rooted in Jesus? Because this is harder than it sounds, and I know that I acknowledge it, but it's vital. It's important. Some of you, some of you, it's your time to step into Christian counseling. You've got some traumas you've got to walk through. You've got some traumas that have affected your relationship with Jesus, your relationship with the people closest to you, and the church. It's time. It's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. And find the right person. Finding a good counselor is like dating. It's okay to say, this isn't working out. And the next thing, some of you, you need to get some good Christian people around you. That you, some of the people that are most influencing you don't know God. That's not good. It's, it's okay to have those friends. Don't hear me wrong. We are, we are called to reach those who don't know Jesus and to surround our lives with them. But those who are closest to us, they need to have our same values. Get into a small group. Get people who can love and support you and pray for you and challenge you and walk with you. And some of you, you have deeper questions, and I love that. Because my job is to support you as the primary discipler. Hey, email the church. Ask for me. Say, Pastor Parker told me I could email him and ask for him. I want some resources. Send those to me, and I got you. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to be clear about what it means to follow Jesus. Super clear, because our kids need to know it. Our friends need to know it. And then we're going to lay down our identity to Jesus. We're going to give it up. We're going to give it to him. We're going to receive what he has for us, because we don't want to be rooted in the temporary. We want to be rooted in the eternal, right? That's, that's, that's our goal. That's, that's where we're going. And then the last thing, right, the last thing that we need to do is this. We need to get going and take risks. We need to get going and take risks. If you wait for perfection, it's not going to come. If you wait until you feel 100% confident to do whatever you feel God's going to call you to do, hate to break it to you, the day's not going to come. If you want to wait until you build up your faith good enough so that you can start building your kids' faith up and up, every day is vital. Don't do that. And I don't speak out of um, uh, ignorance. I speak from experience. One of the uh, flaws of mine is that I am a hardcore perfectionist. It's bad. It's bad, guys. It sounds like a flex. It's not. (laughs) It has helped me out a lot in life. It made me successful in school. It made me successful in some jobs. But it also cripples me because I get so fixated on a task or a person becoming perfect that I actually um, don't make a decision at all. It cripples me, and that's not good. If you operate in the fear of your kids rejecting you because you talked about Jesus at the dinner table, you'll never get to that point. If you're afraid that your friends will abandon you for trying to encourage them in a godly way so you don't do it at all, you'll never get there. This is what the Bible says about that. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear. Emphasize on not. Not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And you'll need this spirit for the next thing that I'm about to talk about, because it's important. Do you want your children to have a faith that is worth holding on to? Do you want your faith to be worth holding on to? Right now in our youth ministry, we, uh, specifically in our small groups, we have a goal We have a goal to empower and develop young people, but specifically, our main goal is this. It is to move people from encountering to engaging. From encountering Jesus, right, a service environment, a conference, a summer camp, to engaging with Jesus. To move them from encountering God on a maybe weekly basis to engaging with Scripture on a daily basis. That's our goal in youth small groups right now because we've acknowledged that the world requires more from them, requires more from their faith that they live in. I don't want students, and, and, and I know you don't want students, who can just recite church facts. They can just spit off Bible verses because they had to repeat it over and over and over again. They know church history like the back of their hand. What we actually want are people who can critically think about their faith. They can critically think about it. They can read the Bible and not say, oh yeah, my mom told me about that. Cool, let's move on. They can say, hey, I heard this. What does that mean? 
They can ask questions. They can engage with Jesus. And I don't mean any kind of questions, guys. This is the uncomfortable part. Questions that are going to make you uncomfortable. Questions that you're not going to know the answer with. Hey, mom and dad, I was reading my Bible. Why was God's design for sex only in marriage? Because I can guarantee you, Netflix is not going to tell them that. Hey, mom and dad, why is it important that I resolve problems with people before I come to worship? Why does God want me to do that? Hey, let me free you of any pressure real quick. It's okay not to know. I'm going to give you, I'm going to hand feed you an answer when that happens. You ready? I don't know, son. I don't know, daughter. But let's figure it out together. Hmm. You affirmed their question, and now you get to grow your faith together. That's the beauty of, yeah, please give that, that's amazing. That is amazing. So we wanna move them from encountering Jesus to engaging Jesus, and this is my last thought. This is my uh, last thought, last thought. Our faith, right, if we're gonna operate in our faith, we gotta take risks, guys. We got to take risks. Our faith grows when it takes risks, and as a perfectionist, I don't like to do that. I avoid it like the plague. Some of us, we avoid it like corona. Amen. Come on. We just, we're like, nope, no risks. Risk ass- assessment, that's too high. Not going to do it. But to grow our faith, it requires that we take risks. And if you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe the brother of Jesus, James. He said this, consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy when the world throws junk at you. Consider it pure joy when your faith is tested because it's going to grow you. And those of us who have been through some stuff know that's true. 12 years ago, um, actually almost to the day, 12 years ago, uh, someone invited me to church and I said yes. And because of that invitation, my life was radically changed. And parts of this church was changed. And she no longer goes to this church, but everything I did from that day until the rest of my life is fruit from her faith risk. She stepped out. She got uncomfortable. She brought me to church. I found Jesus. And the rest was history. Twelve years from now, you won't remember this message. You won't. That's just the truth. But you'll remember a church and a God who created a space for you to take faith risks. Twelve years from now, twenty years from now, your kids won't remember if you said the perfect thing in the right moment. They won't remember if you lived the perfect life, but they will be incredibly thankful that you created space, that you took faith risks, and then you created space for them to take faith risks as well, to ask uncomfortable questions, to critically think about the Bible, to to step into a space that makes you uncomfortable, all for the glory of God. If we want a faith worth holding on to, we need to take risks. If we want faith that our kids are going to hold on to, we need to take risks. Now, some of you today, you, you, you've been hearing me talk, and um, you're like, Pastor Parker, that sounds really great, but I'm not there yet. My, uh, my faith is kind of non-existent right now. Well, let me, let me tell you what you're signing up for. See, some 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life, a sinless life, to be tempted in every way possible. Every temptation that you've experienced, he experienced. And then he led that perfect life willingly to a crucifixion, a death, one of the most gruesome deaths in history, actually. And he willingly took that up, not just um, for his own gain or his own uh, pleasure, but so that when his body was nailed to that cross, our sins were nailed to that cross too. And that as he died on that cross, and as his blood was poured out, that we, we would be cleansed of anything, any blemish, any issue, anything whatsoever, starting from yesterday all to the rest of our lives. And then on the third day, 
and everybody thought hope was lost, but the Savior of the world was gone. God resurrected him. Not only taking on our sin, but defeating it for good. And in the same way that Jesus was resurrected very physically, we get to be resurrected spiritually today. A new life, a new identity, a new creation in Jesus. So for what? So that we could have direct access to our Father in heaven. So that we could have direct access to heaven now. So that we could have peace when we face troubles of many kind in this world. And the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it's not just in this building, it's in you. You're the temple now. You're the holy place now. You are precious in God's eyes. All you have to do is say yes to the invitation of belief and start moving your feet along with Jesus. So if that's you, I wanna pray for you right now. I wanna give you that opportunity to receive Jesus. Let's pray. Bow your heads with me if you could. Holy Spirit, we just invite your presence here right now. And when we say that, we, just, we really just mean make us more aware of you. God, we acknowledge that your word says where two or more are gathered in my name, there I shall be. So Lord, you are here. And every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's just really just take a moment to rest in the presence of God. Lord, come. Would you prompt hearts, prompt minds, Lord, to, to return to you, Jesus. And God, I thank you for every single parent in here, Lord. Every single parent that is trying their best. Whether it's parents of preschoolers, parents of elementary schoolers, youth, or parents of adults. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for calling them as a parent. Lord, I thank you for giving them grace when they didn't do everything right. Mm, yeah, Lord, and I thank you that there's always time to grow. No matter how young, how old. And so Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would touch those areas of our lives that need uh, a, a faith push. God, a, a risk push where we say, you know what, you're right, I'm gonna take a risk, Jesus. Help me take that step. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would take away any barriers or walls that are keeping us from fully acknowledging or fully understanding what it means to be with you, to do life with you, to accept that invitation, Jesus. Would you help our identities be rooted in you, that the gunk of our hearts and our minds would just be freed and loosed and shaken free, God, so that we can surrender that to you and receive that new life and new creation that you've given us, Lord. God, give us a spirit, not a fear power. So if that was you, if while I was talking, you feel like you're ready to make that next step into accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, acknowledging the Son of God and, and what he did for you, and, 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 and you want to step into that followership of what it means to be a Christian. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to count to three and ask you to raise your hand up. And when I do that, uh, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not gonna turn the lights on so that everybody could look at you and see you. This is between me, you, and the Lord. I just wanna know who I'm praying for. And so if that's you, if you're ready to make that decision, if that's you, one, two, three, shoot your hand up right now. I see you. Anyone else? I see you. You can put your hands down. All right, I want everyone from the front of this room to the back of this room to pray this prayer with me and out loud. And we do that, even if you've done it a hundred times, it's to make those people feel comfortable to pray that prayer because there's power when we speak things out. Okay, you guys ready? Repeat after me. Everyone say, Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender to you. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just give a shout of praise for everyone who, who just made that decision right now? I'm so thankful. And if that was you online, if you click that button, hey, we're praising right along with you. If you prayed that prayer today, I, I, I haven't asked if you have a request. As you walked in, you should have received a program. And inside of that is a connect card. 
okay? And, and that's just a way for you to communicate with us. And so what I would like for you to do is, is go ahead and tear that off right now. Grab a pen on the seat in front of you and um, just write as much information as you feel comfortable with. But make sure you check that box that says, I gave my life to Jesus. I took that step with you, Pastor Parker. Or if you just got a prayer request or a praise report, you got something you would like for us to walk with you in and pray for you with, and, and you want to share that with us, you can write that on that Connect card as well. And then what you're going to do is there's actually a clear box on your way out that says Connect Cards. You can drop it in there um, on your way out. And if this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for coming. And hopefully you got our gift for you. If not, please stop by the information desk. We got a blue bag with a ton of good stuff in it that we just want to bless you with today. But let me speak to all of those who call Vineyard their home. I want to say a big thank you. Thank you for sacrificially giving week in and week out, every single week. It just blows my mind that even through a pandemic, this church is, is still generous and wants to give back to others and wants to sow into God's kingdom and, and the community and our food pantry is thriving. So thank you guys so much for, for consistently giving. Um, you don't always get to see those blessings. Uh, so thank you so much. But if you would like to partner with us, um, whether for the first time or you're hopping back in, just want to tell you those three ways. Right on our website, vineyardchurch.com, there's a button in the corner that says give. Um, and if you're watching online, uh, you can click that give button right there in the Vineyard Live platform. Um, and you can do that on smartphone, tablet, desktop, computer, or texting. Um, it's simple, it's easy. You just uh, put in the number 45777, that's your texting number, and then in the body, uh, you're gonna put VCC and then the amount that you would like to give and just hit send and the rest um, is super easy. Or if you write checks, you can just make that out to Vineyard Church and drop that in the clear box on your way out. Now, if you're still writing on a Connect card or, or writing your prayer request, please keep doing that. But if you could stand with me, um, if you're able to, we are going to head back into a time of worship. And I love worship. It's just singing songs to God. We believe that in the same way that we uh, sing songs in our car that affect our mood, when we sing songs to God, they affect our inner being. And so we're going to do that right now. We're going to take everything God was just doing, and we're going to lift it up and lay it down and say, hey, Lord, do something. So let me bless you with a prayer, guys. Father, we thank you so much for who you are that you love us, you value us, you want the absolute best for us. God, help us get clear on who you are. God, help us have our identity rooted in you and help us take risks. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.